Hi everyone, I'm Tony. Today I'm going to talk about how to defeat MD5. Yes, you may hear about how powerful the MD5 is, but the reality is, any password with length less than 8 can be defeated in one second. And actually, uh, all the password that belongs to this table can also be defeated in one second. For example, um, alphabets and digits and symbols with uh, length less than 8 can be defeated in one second. Or lowercase alphabets plus digits with length, with length 8 can also be defeated in one second. If, it, if you don't believe that, I can show to you. Uh, for example, I have a terminal here. And we just use the MD5 hash to get a value. For example, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. This is um, eight lenses string, right? And here we get its hash value. We copy it. And here, I already opened a, a online online window so this that this website can help you to correct the md5 value of the short string and let's try it you see you see after I press the button it immediately should made the read out and we can try another one for say this okay and again we copy this md5 value to this website again it's success it succeed right yeah perfectly correct so how does this happen Today I'm going to teach you how does this work. Yeah. So let's think about the simplest method, the naive method. If you are the hacker, how will you defeat an MD5? So the simplest way is to just store all the MD5 values. Of the passwords. For example, if we store all the three digits numbers of MD5 value, and then obviously we can crack any three digits numbers MD5. Well, that sounds good, but this method will cost too much space to store the MD5 table. For example, to crack the length of eight lowercase alphabets MD5. You will need to store. You will need to store at least this this bats to correct a password with length eight. And do you know how large is this space? Actually, it equals to 3328 gigabytes. So, apparently, this, this is not the correct solution. But this brute force method inspired us to have the better solution. That is the rainbow table. To tell you how the rainbow table work, firstly, I must introduce uh, the reduction function. So what is, reduct what is reduction function? Firstly, let us define h be a mapping from p to small h, where the small p is a set of all the lower cases alphabets uh, with, let's say, with length 3. And let small h be a set of all hash values of p. Uh, we write down here. 
uh, remember, both small p and small h are a set. Okay, fine. So this big H is our hash function. And now let's, uh, let us image another function, R. R maps H to P. But note that R is not the reverse function of H. Because it is impossible to get an inverse function of a hash function. Rather, R is just a function that maps set small h to set small p. For example, if we have uh, h and us equals to this hash value, then maybe our R will work like this. So you see, the, the output of big H is the input of big R, but the output of big R is not the same as big H. So all we need is just the R to map from the hash value to a three lengths alphabets. That's enough. So this R is a correct reduction function that we needed later. Okay, so far so good. And we just need one more step to get to the key idea of the rainbow table. Okay, let's continue. Let's say a string, not string, a chain. A chain like this. Does it clear to you? Can you guess what's mean by this chain? It's obviously we're using the big H, the hash function, to hash a string ca called NUS. And the result is this one. And after this one, we use the R function. Remember the R function? Uh, the R function maps the hash value to another alphabet, three lenses alphabet. And again, in the chain, we use the same hash function again to map this alphabet to another hash value and at last we use an r to map this hash value again to um, alphabets okay so what does this mean Um, well, you can find in the, this chain is pretty interesting because obviously, given any elements in, in this chain, you can easily find the elements after it by just store function h and r, right? You, you don't need to store all the chain, but you just need to store the h and r. So you can get any elements below a given element. But that's not what we want. What we want is given an element in the chain. We can find the element before it, rather after it. So is that possible? Well, how about we store not only H and R, but also store the head and the tail of the chain. If we store the head, tail, H, and R, then it means, given a hash value in the chain, we can find the head of the chain, right? Because you can find any elements after a given element. And now you have the tail and head information in your memory. So, so since now you have the head, you can find all the elements in this chain. Well, congratulations. If you understand what I'm talking about, you should already know how to get the initial value of a hash value. Because now, just know we have proved that given any elements in this chain, you can, you can get 
the value before it. So, say if you if you got a hash value of a three b c eight a a, then you can get its plan text of w e f. Right. Okay. Wonderful. So it means that if we have many of this kind of chains that contains all the hash values in set small h within the chain's body, then given any hash value in small h, we can start from we can we can start we can start from this hash value in the chain and then alternatively using h and r. So we can go through the all the train until we get the tail. And after we get the tail, we can find the head by the tail. And then we can go along from the head along with the chain to find the value before the hash value. Yeah, that's, that's pretty simple. But we have a problem here. What's the problem? Let me tell you. Let's do this example. So you can see in this chain, we have two chains, but mm, we found there are some redundant part of these two chains. The NUS, right? So NUS, WF. WF. So basically, we have a collision of these two chain from this point, or say from the point of this chain. But uh, look at these two chains. They have totally different head node and the tail node. And since we just store the head node and tail node, we cannot tell that the two chains are, are redundant in their body. Why is a serious problem? Because when we use uh, a chain, a hash chain like this, we want to reduce the cost of space by just storing the head and the tail. When when our when our memory table contains so many this kind of redundant chains, it will reduce our space efficiency. So how do we solve this problem? In fact, it's it's not complicated. We just use different reduct function, R1, R2, R3, in each steps in the chain. So even one collision occurs, it will not affect the next node in the chain. Pretty simple, right? And because we use many different reduct function in the chain, it's just like a rainbow. So that's why we call this technique the, the rainbow table. Yes. So far, we have introduced how rainbow table works and how does it debate MD5 uh, or any other hash values. And now we can give out the complexity of this interesting algorithm. And uh, the brute force, the brute, here is the time, com time complexity and space complexity of brute force and rainbow table. You can see it by yourself. And I want to say something about that we have that how we protect against the rainbow table. To protect against the rainbow table, you just need to add sort value to your password before hashing it. Mm. To be straightforward, I prepared two formulas for you. You can just use them before you're hashing your password so no one can get your password anymore. And remember, don't use the default sort value 
of some open source frameworks because that's equivalent you didn't use the sort value and make sure others don't know your sort okay this is all the video thank you very much